Good evening. Good evening and welcome. Welcome to the signature event and the closing night of World Food Week at Hart House. I'm tremendously proud and excited to introduce you to tonight's guest. Dr. Vandana Shiva has been a forerunner in the movement to empower communities to reclaim the commons and free themselves of the control that corporations and governments have, have asserted over our lives. Tonight, Dr. Shiva speaks to Earth Democracy, a philosophy that is focused on inclusive, nonviolent, community-based initiatives and decision-making in which we freely share the Earth's resources and work towards and empower the public to take up a number of actions. It's a holistic concept that can empower the public, but tonight Dr. Shiva will illustrate how we can start making a difference and be change with respect to the simple decisions we make several times every day as to what we serve on our plates. A seemingly inconsequential choice, yet our collective food actions are linked to a myriad of values and outcomes that inform our food systems. This is a timely moment in history for this message to take hold. Many of us are looking for ways in which to draw these connections, to find meaning and to make a difference. The food movement has therefore become an exciting arena in which these desires are taking shape. And it is in this spirit that Hart House and its decision to host World Food Week uh, was conceived and brought to fruition. Indeed, Hart House has established itself on campus as a leader in food sustainability and food politics. Our events and catering program, or department rather, and our gallery grill restaurant are working toward and having success at operating from environmentally and sustainability practices and actually uptaking in the local food movement. We're also very fortunate to have, as our director of events and catering, Arlene Stein, who is a co-chair uh, of Toronto um, Slow Food Movement and a member of the International Slow Food Movement. And under her guidance and leadership, a collective of students uh, calling themselves the University of Toronto Campus Agricultural Project, project, project um, have uh, gathered over the course of this semester and several greenhouse projects and several plots of land on university campus and several roofs uh, belonging to the University of Toronto have been growing produce over the summer. Indeed, this group met just yesterday to share their successes and to plan for the next steps. So I can say with conviction that good things are growing on campus and right here on Hart House soil. These initiatives are some of the ways in which Hart House is committed and engaged in learning as envisioned in our new vision statement. Hart House as a living laboratory of social, artistic, recreation and cultural experiences where all voices, rhythms and traditions converge. Our goal in co-curricular learning is to provide opportunities for students and other community members inside and outside of the university to encounter themselves in a process of self-discovery and to round out their other, more formal learning in order to become part of an empowered public. I'd like to welcome Sasha Chapman to the stage who will introduce Dr. Vandana Shiva. Thank you. Good evening. I hope you're all as excited as I am to um, hear Dr. Shiva speak. Um, she's one of the world's most outspoken and passionate thinkers and speakers. Um, and when I was first asked to um, introduce her at uh, the end of this World Food Week, which is such a great, has been such a great event on campus, um, I began to think a little bit about what drew me to um, food writing as a career, because I, that's my day job. Um, and what it is, is it's the idea that food connects us all. That's what drew me to it. It's what makes food such a powerful tool for activism. 
Um, it builds bridges between people. It's what makes families. It creates communities. And for me, food has always been a way of understanding the world and, and my place in it. And that's because, you know, it all comes back to that cliche, we are what we eat. Well, Dr. Shiva takes that idea one step further um, in her book and philosophy and movement, The Earth Democracy, where the food that we eat, the water that we drink, the air that we breathe, and our ecological identity and our ecological security depends on those things. And so does our freedom. Because if we don't have control over our food and our water, we don't have control over ourselves. Um, I'm going to tell you a few things about Dr. Shiva. She was born in northern India, in the foothills of the Himalayas. Um, her father was a forest officer, and her mother had a farming background. And it's, it was from them, she has said, that she inherited a deep love of her nature and also her trademark fearlessness, which uh, comes in handy when you're taking on big corporations like Monsanto or lobbying um, at the UN. Um, tonight it's fitting that she's speaking at a Canadian university because she was once a student in Canada. Um, after studying physics in India, she came to Canada and did a master's degree in philosophy of science and later a PhD in particle physics at the University of Western. Um, after returning back to India, she was horrified to see the deforestation that was going on in her native land. Um, trees were being cut down to grow apples for Western Westerners and she joined the Chipko movement, um, a grassroots women's movement. Later, working as a scientist in India, she began to question how science and technology impact the environment. And so she decided to form an interdisciplinary foundation, the Research Foundation for Science, Technology, and Ecology. Um, in 1991, she founded Navdanya, which means nine seeds. Um, and that was to symbolize the, the nine staple crops um, which India needs to be able to produce in order to be um, sovereign. Um, she, and that organization has def protected biodiversity, it defends farmers' rights, promotes organic farming. Um, it's made the difference, a difference in the lives of millions of farmers and one of the most amazing things is that it's conserved more than 2,000 rice varieties in India and established seed banks. And one of the incredible things that uh, Dr. Shiva is able to do is she works at the grassroots level and works directly with people in subsistence farming, but then she also can move just as easily in, in the political sphere and the intellectual sphere. Um, working with organizations like the UN. She's the vice president of Slow Food. Um, and she's, she's a co-founder of Bija Vidya Pit, which is a sister organization to the UK's highly regarded Schumacher College. Um, and that's another way to spread the message of sustainability. Um, Dr. Shiva has won numerous awards, written dozens of books, and um, hundreds of articles in her campaign. Um, before I turn the floor over to her, I'd, I'd just like to say that when everybody goes home tonight, we're all going to be head spinning with, with all the wonderful ideas and philosophies and uh, politics of tonight. But it's always important to think about, think on the small scale and think about what we can actually do, what we can implement, how, how we can somehow implement um, that optimism and uh, those philosophies, um, you know, whether it's just changing what you eat for breakfast tomorrow. And that's one of the things that I love most about food and what makes it such a, um, an attractive tool for activism, because you get three chances a day to make a difference. Um, and one final note of uh, housekeeping, if you can just turn off cell phones and no flash photography, please. Thank you.
Well, I thought I would talk about the worldview that really inspires me, which is the worldview of Earth democracy, of us all as members of an Earth community. It's nothing very new. That's how all ancient societies viewed themselves. And in India, we have a term for it. It is Vasudeva Kutumbakam. Vasundhara is the goddess of the earth goddess. One of her names, she's got thousands of names. Everything in India has a thousand names or more. <laughs> um, and Kutumbakam means the family, the family of the earth. And my early days um, with the Chipko movement taught me how this earth family was being assaulted by ecological degradation. But it was 1984 that really woke me up to what was wrong with agriculture. You know, I trained as a physicist and a philosopher of science and did my PhD in the foundations of quantum theory on, guess what, hidden variables and non-locality. Why would I end up working on agriculture and food systems? In 1984, we had a series of very, very violent events in India. We had a drought, and I looked at the data, but the data showed there was no drought. The rainfall had not decreased, and yet people had no fodder, their crops were failing. So I went to the region where this very, very severe impact was being felt without rainfall failure, and a farmer explained to me how the change from old varieties of sorghum to the dwarf varieties of sorghum had depleted the organic matter. Nothing was going back to the soil. The soil had lost capacity to hold the moisture. So the rain was still coming, but you had a drought. And in June of that year, we had uh, an invasion into the Golden Temple of India by the army because Punjab, the land of the Green Revolution, had ended up becoming a place of civil war, of extremism, of terrorism. And I kept thinking to myself, this thing called the Green Revolution about which I had no idea, um, it got a Nobel Prize, that much I knew. I said, so why is Punjab at war? If it was about peace, what went wrong? And December that year, 2000, um, in, 1990, in 1984, on the night of 2nd of December, a gas leaked from a pesticide plant owned by Union Carbide in the city of Bhopal. 3,000 people died in that night. They were sleeping. It happened in the middle of the night. And since then, 30,000 have died. 30,000 also died in Punjab. Hundreds and thousands are still being born, maimed, and crippled. 25th anniversary of Bhopal this year. So by the end of the year, I was asking myself, why has agriculture become like war? So I started to study what had happened. I mean, I, every time I have, I have a puzzle, that's why I became a physicist. You, know? you have to understand the world you live in. And I couldn't understand this world of agriculture. So I did a study for the United Nations and it was published then as a book called The Violence of the Green Revolution. And as a result of that book, I started to get invited to agriculture meetings. I had nothing to do with agriculture. Um, but in the process, I started to listen to agribusiness. I started to listen to what they were planning for our future. And in, 90, in 1987, at a conference, they laid out their dream vision of controlling the food system and controlling the health because agrochemical industry is actually the chemical industry. I had learned while studying the Green Revolution that the reason agriculture had become like war is because the war industry had moved into agriculture with their tools, pesticides that kill, herbicides that are designed to destroy, fertilizers that now were retooled in the explosive factories that used to make explosives for the war. 
The Green Revolution had basically then done breeding to push these chemicals. The public relations story is it was to feed the world. But Norman Borlaug's main agenda was how do you design plants that can withstand high doses of chemicals because indigenous varieties didn't like chemicals. They would do what I call the civil disobedience. <laughs> they just rejected the chemicals and lodged. Just lay down and said, sorry, don't, don't apply this junk on us. So they had to rebreed crops. And the dwarf varieties were, were the varieties that were then evolved in order to withstand high doses of chemicals. The genetic engineering revolution is the next step at controlling agriculture. And the industry said, we'll be five of us by the turn of the century. And the three tools the successful companies will have in their hands will be genetic engineering. And they said it very clearly, because farmers can't do it. So we will sell it as superior. Patents, which genetic engineering allows you to take, because you could not at that time go around the world and say, I have invented a plant. But once you've genetically engineered it, you can now say, I've invented a plant. Not that the plant was invented. All that was done was shooting genes into cells. That wasn't the making of the plant. It was the shooting at the plant. And in this two decades of, um, of genetic engineering, all we've had is really two varieties, the two applications of genetic engineering. Herbicide tolerant crops, so that you can spray more herbicide, and Bt toxin crops, so now you don't have to spray the pesticide from outside, you spray it from inside. You let the plant make its own pesticides. So genetic engineering patenting, and the third tool was free trade agreements. The industry was working at that point on designing what would become the World Trade Organization. So I started to keep track. And when the draft treaty of WTO was leaked in 1991, um, it was the intellectual property rights agreement of that treaty that really shook me up. We've had patents before, we've had copyright, we've had design law, this was not new. What was new was first that a global agreement would enforce this around the world, and secondly, in, you know, hidden away in Article 27.3b was the imposition of patenting of life. That countries now had to start patenting genetically engineered organisms and also ordinary plants, but in, in non-genetically or, or engineered organism, there was an option that you could have a sui generis system, an alternative. The other agreement in the WTO is the agreement on agriculture. The third agreement is the agreement on sanitary, phytosanitary measures. And if you're wondering what that is about, it's basically about food safety. Soon after the WTO agreement came into force, GM seeds started to move around the world. And not only did they move around the world, there were attempts to force GM seeds on the world, and along with them, force patenting of life. How did the forcing happen? Let me give you two examples. India has a very, very progressive law on patent, it had a progressive law on patent, uh, which did not allow patents on seeds or agriculture and allowed only process patents on medicine. A 1995 case, the minute WTO is born, a case is filed against India that basically forced India to start changing her patent laws. We've had to change our laws three times, but because we have strong movements in the country, we never allow full monopoly. We always put in safeguards. And of course, the industry doesn't rest. It keeps suing. It just keeps suing our government. The latest is against um, an article in our patent law that says 
that only authentic inventions will be patentable because a patent is an exclusive right for something you have invented and it allows you to prevent anyone else from making, using, selling, distributing, improving the patented product. When seed is patented, it's an exclusive right to prevent farmers from saving seed. When seed becomes intellectual property, sharing of seed becomes a crime. And Monsanto is on record to say, in designing the intellectual property rights agreement of WTO, we were the patient, the diagnostician, and the physician all in one. We offered, a, we, we defined a problem, and the problem was that farmers save seeds. And we offered a solution, it should be made illegal for farmers to save seed. And this is the reason I started Navdanya. Navdanya means nine seeds, and it isn't just saving the seeds of the nine staple grains. Navdanya is nine, and nine is the highest number you can have. After that is one and zero. So you come back to the one and zero. And I learned about the significance of nine and nine crops while doing seed collections. I'd gone to a tribal area in southern India, and this tribal farmer had nine crops in his field. As a result of having studied the Punjab agriculture and having realized the devastating impact of the monocultures of the mind that create monocultures in the field, every time I see diversity, I start to count, you know, it gets me excited. So I counted nine crops in his field. And he just turned around and said, yeah, Navdanya. And I said, you're saying it so casually. And he gave me a discourse on how at the planetary level, at the level of the field, and at the level of the, our bodies, we need diversity. That planetary balance, ecological balance on the land, and nutritional balance of our bodies is one interconnected, seamless whole. Now, at that time, the word used for di diversity was not diversity. If the, even the word biodiversity had not come in circulation. The Convention on Biological Diversity still had to be you know, shaped and ratified. The only word we had in the vocabulary was genetic resources. And I used to find it very difficult to talk about genetic resources because you had to reduce it to atoms of the plant in a local vernacular language. You can't inspire farmers to save seeds when you say atoms of the plant. <laughs> but the minute I got this explanation on Navdanya, I said, this is it. I mean, any farmer understands the significance of Navdanya. You know, we have nine planets. We have Navaratras, we have Navgrahas, we have Navaratans, everything that is sacred is nine. And um, very interestingly, I was on a climate pilgrimage recently, and I ended up in Badharamsala on the 9th of September of 2009, and the premier of the Tibetan government in exile said to me, you've come on such an auspicious day. Nine, nine, nine. Um, of course, this diversity is our defense against the war and violence that agriculture has become. It's violence at every level. It's a violence of the mind, because we are being forced to lose our intelligence about how to live on Earth. We are being impoverished to understand the tremendous diversity on this planet as a food base. Our food base has been reduced from 8,500 crops to eight globally traded commodities and increasingly to four genetically engineered crops. So if you look now, everything is corn, soya, corn, soya, corn, soya, corn, soya. Humanity has never eaten soya. The Eastern Asian regions used to eat fermented soya because it has very high levels of anti-nutritive factors. It's a war against people. Bhopal and Punjab are just one example, but there's new wars being unleashed. In India, as a result of the introduction of the genetically engineered BT crops, farmers have, to be, have been pushed into deep debt. Seed that used to cost seven rupees 
jumped to 1,700 rupees a kilogram, cotton seed. Um, the Bt is a toxin taken from a soil organism and put into the cotton plant or into a potato plant or into a maize plant. Um, it's supposed to be controlling pests. It's sold as a pest control technology. But what it's done is, of course, pest, uh, pest resistance has emerged in the bollworm, which it's supposed to control. And meantime, new pests have emerged. 300, 400% increase in non-target pest populations. Insects that were never a pest problem in cotton have now become a pest problem. So farmers are spraying 13 times more than they were spraying on non-BT crops. And BT was brought to us as an alternative to pesticide use. The combination of high cost seed, which now has to be bought every year, huge expenses on pesticides, fertilizers, irrigation, pushes the farmers into deep debt. And cotton farmers are actually not the poorest farmers. Um, in fact, as, as farmers, they were the better of farmers, and the cotton growing regions were the better of regions. But today, in the cotton areas, we have the highest rate of farmer suicide, something us society and civilization has never engaged in. We didn't need to. You know, we believe in uh, the next Janam. You know? There's another life and another life and another life. This one is not the end. But when you have a money lender who is also the agent of the seed and chemical companies taking your land away because you are now in such deep debt and unpayable debt, the farmer ends up committing suicide the day the land is being alienated. And I know this has happened in North America. I remember I was, must have been 1985, I was invited for a big food conference to Guelph. David Hopper, who used to be a Rockefeller person and then he retired as the vice president of the World Bank, he and I had to do this keynote. And David Hopper said, we just don't have to worry about food scarcity anymore because we have genetic engineering, now we'll grow food on the moon, in the desert, and on toxic dumps. <laughs> but outside were farmers' tables, and there was one table with a 1-800 number for farmers who want to commit suicide to help them avoid it. So farmer suicides are not unique to India, it's just that the numbers are so big because the change has been so sudden. So we have had 200,000 farm suicides in the last decade. And in the region where the highest cotton planting of Bt has spread, we have 4,000 here, 4 million acres and 4,000 suicides a year. I, of course, you know, initially used to study the suicides, understand the crisis. Three years ago, I decided to take a pilgrimage. And you know, when I'm confused, I just take a pilgrimage. <laughs> um, and I undertook a seed pilgrimage through the areas to understand why are farmers getting so desperate? I mean, I knew there's an economic despair, but why are they so desperate? And found out that the companies had actually ensured that their seed is destroyed because they engage in what they call seed replacement. They enter a re area and make sure they take away all your local seed. They might even sometimes pay the farmers. And farmers have always had seed. They cannot imagine running out of seed. So they don't treat it as too serious. And the BT cotton fails, they can't turn to their old crops because the crops have gone. So we started com creating community seed banks, which is what Navdania does across the country. We've set up 55 community seed banks. And these are community seed banks because they were started in response to patenting. And for us, keeping seeds in the commons is absolutely vital to food security. The second thing we do is help farmers go chemical free and GMO free. Help them go ecological, help them go organic. And the third thing we do is we've helped farmers build their marketing system so they get a fair price. We've just done a comparison between farmers who continue to grow Bt cotton and the farmers who've gone organic in Vidharva, in central India. Organic farmers are earning 10 times more. 
one of the biggest myths of industrial agriculture is we need it because of higher levels of production. Nothing could be further from the truth. Chemical agriculture, genetic engineering does not produce more food. Take the case of the Green Revolution. Systems of mixed farming and rotational farming were re replaced by chemically fed rice monocultures and wheat monocultures. And in the rice and wheat, the dwarf varieties meant there was no more straw for the animals. So you lost a series of crops that are necessary for a good diet. You lost the pulses, you lost the oil seeds. And in the cereals itself, you lost the biomass. Today, the soils of Punjab are dead and dying. The wheat the farmers of Punjab are selling, which was part of the Green Revolution, is getting rejected because it has lost its nutrient values. Its protein has really declined. The water has gone because these crops require 10 times more water. But if you take a monoculture like that and compare it with a biodiverse system of the kind that nine crops give you, or the 12 crops give you, or the five crops give you, or the seven crops give you, biodiverse ecological systems can have five to 10 times more output of food per acre than an industrial system. The reason the industrial system seems to be productive is the monoculture of the mind measures only the yield of a single commodity and therefore promotes the production of that commodity. As a result of which, you actually manufacture hunger because you stop growing the crops people need for their food. And you force farmers into growing crops with such heavy capital investment that the farmers have to sell everything they grow in order to pay back the debt for the chemicals and the seed. If you just look at the food and agriculture um, organization data, the largest number of hungry people are today in India. They still keep talking about the Green Revolution. The largest number of hungry people are producers in the world. How did we get to a situation where those who produce food are going hungry. Half of, of the hungry, and you know, we've got a billion people now, according to FAO, who are hungry, half of them are food producers because they're not able to retain what they're growing. They're not allowed to grow for themselves. The ethics I have evolved over these years of working is if we do farming in such a way that we first feed the microorganisms of the soil, then the microorganisms will feed us. The second right is the right of those who produce the food. So when we help farmers do marketing, we make sure that the best food stays in the household. The best food stays in the village. We sit and do audits with farmers to say, how much is your real surplus? Do not sell at the cost of your own children right to food. The third, of course, is national food security. And the fourth, which I call the spice of life trade, is the little bit of trade you need to add spice to your life. That's how we used to trade in agriculture. I mean, the only thing that used to be traded when the British started to travel all over the world to look for spices that were actually in India, but they landed in this continent, um, where the Spaniards landed first and then the British followed. The only food that used to be traded at any significant scale was spices. Tiny volumes, pepper used to be traded in weight equal to gold. A sack of pepper, a sack of gold. Which is why, why the European colonizers were so desperate to get hold of India. Which is why they created the East India Company. You know, a sack of gold each time you get a sack of pepper. Um, we will always need a little bit of trade. But we do not need genocidal trade. We do not need trade that is killing the planet. Soya bean is everywhere. It's in the food humans are eating. It's in the food cattle are being fed. Cattle were herbivores. They like to graze. And now they're being fed intensive feed made of soya bean. If they're not being fed a mad cow diet of recycled animals. 
I've traveled in the Amazon. I've seen the Ill illegal factory of Cargill on the Amazon. We have seen how entire stretches of the Amazon are being bulldozed to grow soybean. The land is for free, you've just grabbed it. Large machinery, you kill a few tribals and indigenous people who try to resist. The same thing is happening today in Paraguay. A war is taking place in Latin America for the production of Roundup resistant soya bean. It's a war on the ground as the land is cleared and the forests are cleared and it's a war from the air as Roundup is sprayed. Just as it used to be sprayed, you know, as Agent Orange used to be sprayed in Vietnam, now it's being sprayed on people. And yet we are constantly told genetic engineering will feed the world because it is more productive. If it was that productive, why do you have to expand into the Amazon? Why does every inch of the planet have to be destroyed? It's called, you know, they say ecological farming is extensive farming. Industrial farming is intensive farming. Well, when they land in the Amazon, it's highly extensive in my view. In any case, now the data is out. I mean, in India, we, we saw that genetically engineered cotton wasn't producing more. 1,500 kilograms is what is the figure Monsanto kept putting out. But the reality on farmers' field was 300 to 400 kilograms. They just manufacture data. Yeah. One of the violations that I feel find extremely troubling is the violation of truth. You just manufacture untruth every step of the way. And that untruth now has, uh, at the level of the US, Doug Sherman of um, the Union of Concerned Scientists has just done a study of 20 years of GM planting. And he's used only published data from universities and from scientists. In every case, the yields of genetically engineered crops were lower than equivalent crops grown without genetic engineering. The report is called Failure to Yield. The author is Doug Sherman. On our farms, our biodiverse farms are producing more, much, much more food. But they're never the comparison, they're never the base, because the base is always a fictitious base. You manufacture, I mean, Monsanto had posters all over uh, central India saying, Radhe Sham made 15 acre, uh, 15, 1,500 kilograms per acre. So we hunted up Radhe Sham and said, did you really make that much? And he said, yeah, on my five acres. They just make the five go away and turn it into one acre. Um, and today, Monsanto, all it does is use two groups to really expand its market. One is detectives, and you have the case of Percy Smizer, who was sued after they sent detectives on his farm to collect the seeds. And the other is public relations firms. And then they call it all science-based. There's no science in what Monsanto is doing today. What Monsanto is doing is various forms of warfare against independent scientists who would stand up and do an honest piece of research, against farmers who would continue to do their farming and save their seeds, against governments who would have the guts to ban GMOs, Europe has been very strong on saying no to GMOs, not because European governments are different, but because European people have stayed strong. And uh, I work with the European regions that are GMO-free. 50 regions are legally declared GMO-free. Five governments have, at the national level, implemented bans. So Monsanto took the Europeans to court, to WTO, basically saying we need market access. And this is against the rules of WTO. Every time we hear the word free trade, I think it's very, very important to recognize it's nothing about freedom. It's the opposite. It's about forced trade. It's about forced trade in, and false trade. It's forced because these market openings are created by coercion. 
mean, India never had to create coercive instruments to sell our pepper and our spices. People wanted it and it was sold. GMOs can only enter your market through coercion. And I've been told there's these crazy new free trade agreements at the regional level in Canada as if within a country you don't have free trade. I mean, are there barriers between Quebec and Ontario? Do you collect taxes on the borders? I don't think so. But these free trade agreements are merely tools for corporations to use to open up markets through threat. So if Ontario builds up its local farming systems and starts to do local procurement, then the corporations, Monsanto will come to Quebec and sue Ontario to say, sorry, you cannot have local pr procurement. You are taking away our market. This is exactly what was done when um, uh, British Columbia didn't want to sell its water. And Sunbelt, the company in California, sued and said, we have a right to sell that water. You don't have a right to your own water. Now, this redefinition of rights, that the earth doesn't have rights, species don't have rights, people don't have rights, farmers don't have rights, only corporations have rights, and their rights are to grabbing markets and converting everything into a market, commodifying all life. We have such large-scale hunger on this planet. One billion people are hungry. But another two billion people aren't able to get access to healthy food. They're suffering from diabetes. They're suffering from obesity that comes from rotten food. That right of the people doesn't count because the right to sell is what matters. The commodification of food is at the root of hunger. Not lack of food on this planet not the incapacity of small farms to produce enough food, but the commodification of food. Because the minute something is a commodity, you don't determine where it'll go. And these days, food as a commodity is competing with feed as a commodity, is competing with biofuel as a commodity. And the source of all is the same. So you have food prices rising because the Americans are now giving subsidies to divert corn and soya to run cars as they panic with climate change and peak oil. Of course, industrial agriculture has a lot to do with climate change, an issue that wasn't noticed. I mean, most people thought fossil fuels sort of stop at the level of a city. But with that war machine in agriculture, fossil fuels have also become the driving force of agriculture. And as I've said in my recent book, we are literally eating oil. We're now eating oil. We're eating oil in the forms of fertilizers that come from fossil fuels. And these fertilizers then emit nitrogen oxides, which are 300 times more damaging to the atmosphere than carbon dioxide. You put poor animals into factory farms, you increase the rate of emissions of methane. And nitrogen oxide, carbon dioxide, methane are the three big greenhouse gases. In addition, you go into the Amazon and start chopping down and burning up the forest you have even more emissions in the atmosphere. If you add up the production emissions, the transport emissions, and the conversion of forests into agribusiness plantations, we're talking about 35 to 40% emissions that are destroying our climate as coming from an industrial agriculture. And ecological systems, local food systems, solve this immediately. And they don't just reduce the 40%. They can actually go further and beyond. You don't use nitrogen fertilizers. You start using nitrogen fixing crops. You've got rid of a major source of emissions. You start recycling organic matter and growing more organic matter. You're not just mitigating and bringing down the emissions. You're actually absorbing emissions and putting them in the soil. And in addition, when a drought does come, your soils with higher organic matter are able to withstand the drought better. With climate change, we see increasing parts of India coming under drought more frequently. And whenever I travel to these regions, the farmers who work with us with organic methods have a crop. The farmers who are doing green revolution agriculture have a crop failure. So food security in times of climate change is clearly about diversity, because diversity gives you 
resilience, it gives you insurance, it gives you a cushion in dealing with climate uncertainty. And turning to living carbon is our best insurance. There's a new voc language has become so problematic. Yeah? Uh, suddenly, cr carbon is being criminalized. Yeah? Fossil carbon we should phase out of. But carbon's not the problem because food is carbon. The organic manure we put into the soil is carbon. Our bodies are partly carbon. That carbon is living carbon. And it is maintaining the carbon cycle. And the beauty of it is while only nature over millennia could rot the plants and turn them into fossil fuels, which were never intended to come out, they were supposed to stay down there, humans can be partners with nature to increase living carbon on the planet. We can put more trees, we can put more biodiversity, we can return more organic matter to the soil. Here we have been given this opportunity to return to Gaia. That's Earth democracy, to find our place back in the web of Gaia. And web, the web of life is the food web. Um, I love an old um, ancient Upanishad of India. It's called the Tetre Upanishad. And the Tetre Upanishad, it's a very ecological text, but the ecology is all based on food. It begins with, Everything is food, everything is something else's food. Now you remember you, you've been taught this thing of the world, the species as a pyramid with man sitting on top? Yeah? Poor man gets back, put back in the soil and the microorganisms get him for their food. We wouldn't be building a pyramid in terms of our sense of where we are. We'd be building life webs. And building life webs, we are at the place where either we build these life webs and food webs and earth democracy, or we walk into our extinction. Uh, industry would like to keep making us scared of the 12 milli billion and the 9 billion that will be around in the next century. What they don't talk about is how their actions are destroying the very conditions of human species surviving on this planet whether it is as climate change or it is through the deprivation of food. You know, nature has given every species food. We thought we were intelligent. We became so stupid that we've managed to starve half of humanity. No other species has done it to itself. And the more arrogant we become about controlling nature, the more we deplete our food supply, both its quality as well as its quantity. Very often in the food discussions, an opposition is made between quantity and quality, that we've gained in quantity, but we've lost in quality. We haven't gained in quantity either. It's just an illusion. It's an illusion because, yes, there are more Cargill ships moving around with soya bean around the world, but that's not food for people. And every time people say, oh, but how will we feed the world? I said, nobody feeds the world. The earthworms feed the world. Your mother feeds you. Your neighbor will feed you. Food is a very intimate act. And when it stops being intimate, it stops being food. It becomes something else. I just call it non-food. <laughs> because it's, it's lost its quality of feeding and nourishing us. Uh, and non-food has grown, but food has shrunk. Um, profits of corporations have grown, but nutrition has shrunk. So no matter who you are, you could be poor, you could be rich, you could be in the south, you could be in the north, you could be young, you could be old. No one can now ignore the food issue. No one can ignore transforming the food issue. And we know the solutions are so clear. So many of you are practicing those solutions. It's the solutions we've built in India through Navdanya. Simple solutions, diversify more, localize more, and turn to ecological systems, work with nature rather than against nature. There are, of course, things that come in the way from allowing this movement that is anyway exploding from growing even bigger. Even as the movement grows, the corporate takeover of our food systems grow. The concentration of control over the food system grows. 
And we literally do have those five giants, you know, five seed giants, five agribusiness giants, five processing giants, um, and each of them having wonderful partnerships between each other. Mm. One of the blocks that comes in our minds is, of course, the myths, because we've been made to internalize the myths that without chemicals, without GMOs, the poor won't have food. Uh, Monsanto kept putting out ads a few years ago in Europe to say, you Europeans who don't eat GMOs are starving Africa. And then we would go to Europe with you know, African friends and I would go to Europe and talk about how GMOs are not the answer for Africa. Unfortunately, Bill Gates, the billionaire, is now pouring huge amounts of money in what he calls the Alliance for the Green Revolution for Africa. And he's trying to bring every government, every intergovernmental agency on board to only supply chemicals and GMOs to Africa. And all of us in the food movement need to respond to that in whatever way we can. There's another block, and that block is worrying about cities. You know, cities have grown. How will they be get fed? Well, they've been fed. India has the largest urban population. You know? Delhi alone is now 15 million people. Our staples are grown in India by small farmers, one hectare holding. Small farms produce more biologically. So if you want more food, you have to retain small farms. How, how would the cities be fed? They've been fed in the past. They can be fed in the future. The first shift is we start to make designing food sheds inside the city and around the city as part of urban planning. You know, when we do urban planning, we think of the transport. We think of the cars. We think of the parking lots. But we don't think of the gardens. So many of you, in, um, you know, the introduction told us that there have been gardens started right here on this campus. We need to take the next leap and put it into policy and planning. We have to protect the farmers. We have to reclaim the soil. And I think we need to turn the center and heart of the city, which it should be, from the financial district to the farming district. Another block to the transition is this amazing construction of cheap food. Now, there are two ways you can deal with cheap food. Go the costly way, in which case some people with good buying power will be able to buy the more costly thing. But it'll always stay a niche market, and you can't support the farmers of the world through that niche. The other is to deconstruct the subsidies and monopolies that make high-cost food cheap. The farmers who are committing suicide in India are bearing the burden of a debt because they spent too much. And yet the cotton they sell is cheap because Cargill is able also to trade in, um, in cotton and uh, it collects a $4 billion subsidy from the US to dump and drop the prices. Overall, the, inter the subsidies in the rich countries, which keep agribusiness afloat, these subsidies don't go to small farmers. They go to agribusiness. The subsidies are $400 billion a year, more than a billion dollar a day. Can you imagine what could be done with a billion dollars a day to create sustainable, just, and um, healthy food systems? In India, one trillion rupees per year is being spent on subsidizing chemical fertilizers. And I can't even begin to think of what we could do with one trillion rupees if that subsidy to chemical fertilizers stopped. Soya bean has been dumped on India. India is called the El Dorado of soya by the agribusiness because there are two things they can take over. We, you know, we are a land of pulses. We eat dals. And they can substitute the dals for soya bean. In fact, they even had a program called analog dals. Guess what analog dals are? The same soya bean extruded into a urad dal, the black gram, into the moong dal, the green gram, into a chickpea, 
into the Arhardal, all you have to do is extrude it and design it and color it and paint it and it's food. <laughs> the reason soya bean is cheaper than local alternatives is because soya gets $190 subsidy per ton, which drops the price to below what a third world low cost farmer is producing. It drops the price below the cost of production. No farmer can survive. Until we solve that problem of commodities sold below the cost of production and the dumping on international markets, we'll never be able to protect enough of our food producers and build enough food communities. For that, we definitely need to democratize the way our tax money is used. Governments don't create that money. They take it from us, and then they use it to destroy our food web. I think we need, when we design our food system, when we need to design the transition, I think we need to simultaneously design how public money should be used to support what, and where public subsidies should be withdrawn from. Definitely from fossil fuels, definitely from junk food, definitely from long distance trade in food. And the minute you withdraw those subsidies, you'll have a real authentic level playing field and local will become affordable. Organic will become affordable. We know Monsanto is forcing country after country to adopt genetically modified crops. The way, the, I mean, this is the movement we've built in, in India, this is the movement that's grown in Europe. We just have to have the courage and confidence to declare our towns, villages, regions GMO-free. And then put into place the systems that allow us to be GMO-free. There's no way you can guarantee what you're eating unless you know how it was produced and who produced it. So GMO freedom comes with build, building local links with local farmers who don't use GMOs. Short chains is what this is building, more intimacy. Another block, of course, is the patent laws. The patent laws that have created a planetary seed famine. Nature gave us so much abundance. India had 200,000 rice varieties. We've rescued 3,000. Why should there be five companies selling about five varieties, two or three crops, and then putting some seeds into a doomsday vault, they call it, in Norway? Every field, every farm should be a conservation zone. Because biodiversity is not an obstruction to production. Biodiversity is the means of production. And the more biodiversity we have, the more food and nutrition we have. We've had this mental segregation, this apartheid, that there's wilderness where there's biodiversity and there's farms which can be poisoned monocultures. We have to bring the wild back into farming. After all, anyway, you can't do farming without the wild. You can't do farming without the butterflies and the bees and the pollinators. They are wild. They don't listen to your instruction, even though Cargill would like to, when we had a big campaign and the farmers tore down the Cargill seed plant, the Cargill representative said, oh, these stupid Indian peasants, they don't understand. We have smart technologies that prevent the bees from usurping the pollen. <laughs> and when I was uh, trying to keep uh, genetically engineered foods out through the Convention on Biological Diversity and we put in place the biosafety regulation. I was in the first expert group that drafted the framework for Article 19.3, which allowed a global biosafety regulation of genetic engineering. And during that period, I had many back and forths with Monsanto. I mean, I'm still having lots of back and forths with Monsanto. Um, but Monsanto's representative said, the reason we need Roundup resistant crops is because we have to prevent the weeds from stealing the sunshine. <laughs> I mean, you want a dictatorship so planetary that even the sun should take permission from you on where it shines. <laughs> 
Of course, you want a dictatorship that makes it illegal for farmers to save seeds, and you create all kinds of new laws, the intellectual property laws, the patent laws, even the breeders' laws, the UPOV laws, and the seed certification laws, the licensing laws. They are all designed to create a seed dictatorship. And we learned from Gandhi when such dictatorships existed during the British Empire, that there's only one way you can deal with dictatorship, and that is to recognize it as a dictatorship, and then be informed and inspired by higher law. And in our times, that higher law is the law of Gaia, the ecological law of surviving and growing in an earth democracy. And then you have to say, I will not obey, because there's a higher law. And so in Navdanya, we built a seed satyagraha. The satyagraha was Gandhi's word for civil disobedience. But he called it satyagraha because it is the force of truth. Satya is truth, agre is the force. The force of truth because unjust law and violent law and brute law is based on untruth. The untruth in the case of patenting seed, that the corporations have invented the seed. They claim to be the new creators. That's an absolute lie. Very often, all they've done is pirated the seed. I have fought three cases uh, on piracy. One was on Neem, this wonderful tree that gives us a natural pest control agent, which I started after Bhopal, the whole, you know, no more Bhopal's plant and Neem. Uh, the Basmati, a wonderful Dehradouni Basmati, patented by a Texas company that claimed to have invented it. And Monsanto claimed to have invented an ancient Indian wheat variety that has low gluten. Now we are involved in building a campaign on the piracy of climate resilient crops because the corporations have taken 530 patents. And your Canadian group, et cetera, Pat Mooney does some of the best work in this country on this field. It has listed these patents. You just have to go to the et cetera, ETC website to see this list of patents. We've done a report on all these diversity of resilience that we have, and we're saying this is in the commons. You cannot patent it. But while they continue to patent, we have to create communities of resistance. And just as we've continued to celebrate and distribute seed and constantly declare seed as a commons, and our duty to save and share seed, as our ecological and ethical duty, therefore our duty to not cooperate with patent law that makes saving and sharing seed a crime. We can do this everywhere. We encourage schools to do it. We distribute seeds of freedom. We, you can do it in the University of Toronto Gardens. You can do the seed satyagre with the farmers around because we cannot afford to let the farmers be the ones who defend themselves. They are already assaulted by this food war that is designed to wipe them out. So we have to be there in solidarity. After all, as was said, we eat three times a day. And if we eat three times a day, it's our duty to say thank you to the food, to say thank you to the farmers who grew it, and to stand by this biodiversity, by the soil, by the sunshine, and by the farmers to build another system. And when you think of it, there are just five companies in each sector, five seed, five agribusiness and trade, five in processing. We are 300 million species, six billion people. How can we feel weaker than them? Thank you. so much. That was wonderful and inspiring. We have some time for um, some questions.